this uh, started as a, as I was looking for normalization and uh, normalization methods for uh, especially for correlation, uh, gene expression correlation and stuff like that. So uh, looking for the papers, the recent papers, I came upon this uh, this article, which seems to actually yeah be exactly what I was looking for to see how various uh, normalizations. Uh, methods affect uh, correlation or expression RNA seq data expression values. Um, so this is actually 22, uh, 2022. So it's this year in January. Uh, it's a survey of uh, this was an ambitious project project to try a combination of 36 uh, workflows, which we'll see how they. It's kind of a bit. It's a bit forced, but uh, it's 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 an interesting, ambitious uh, goal to see, to try to make some, uh, to draw some conclusions about what would be the best approach. And there are some uh, debatable uh, points in this uh, with this uh, article, I think, with this paper, uh, in the sense that uh, we'll see. Uh, Actually, we'll get to the, the way they used ground truth uh, to establish, you know, precision and recall. Uh, that's always a pain, especially when it comes to uh, gene networks, right? Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll get there. But yeah, this is from the abstract, right? Basically, this, so this, uh, all these slides maybe could be very word, worthy because especially they are based on my notes on the, uh, on the paper. Um, but yeah, it's so um, we we'll see they tried these 36 different workflows based on combination of various methods. And of course, the results uh, is, are not really surprising. They say that between sample normalization has the biggest impact, which, um, which was kind of expected. So it wasn't, the, the thing is the discussion here, how do you will see how, how to get to the, uh, to estimate what they say, consider gold standard at ground, ground truth. Now, the disclaimer here would be that uh, I have no prior knowledge or, or prior knowledge on and really zero experience on networks, on gene co-expression networks. So uh, looking at this paper, um, I was tempted, uh, the, you know, the, looking at the, for everything, a lot of things were new to me. So I just noticed that, uh, after reading a bit and uh, intended to dismiss some of the uh, approaches that they tried because it was, but I think it's mostly because of my ignorance about the subject, but still it's interesting to, to see maybe you can give me some, uh, your opinions about what they do here. So just a refresher, I guess we go quickly through this, uh, what are gene co-expression networks, right? It's just, uh, just representing essentially they are trying to, first of all, the, the goal here is that it's a computational effort to reverse engineer biological gene interactions, but it's not very well uh, defined. The interactions is just correlation. It's just, it's just the basic idea of correlation. So they don't infer cause, causation. And that's actually the main uh, philosophical issue, I would say here, because, you know, because correlation and uh, it's not causation. So uh, it's it's always dangerous to try to infer uh, relationships, uh, functional relationship, relationships when you only have correlation. So, and that's a less, much less ambitious version, you know, gene co-expression networks, much less uh, ambitious than uh, gene regulation, regulatory networks, right? Where you have uh, directions for the, uh, for the interaction um, and then various biochemical processes and, no regulate up regulation down regulation you can uh, when on gen co expression you cannot claim anything mathematically you know algorithmically this is just a undirected uh undirected graph right so you just have connections of various maybe if you use a weighted graph uh the connections are you know more or less intense correlation based just on correlation so it's not that uh, rich in information now, yeah, the basic uh, construction, just to remind, is just you have the, you know, like we have this expression matrix, which is like what we have in uh, assays, in RSE objects, in, in you know, 
our cases. Um, genes versus samples, right? Uh, and from that, uh, you usually the Peterson correlation. I mean, it's not, it's that the, that's the most, uh, I think, used uh, uh, correlation method, even though WGCNA uses a slightly different uh, variation of that. Um, and they compute this correlation matrix, uh, right? Between, uh, and basically that's the first step, right? To get this correlation matrix all versus all genes. And uh, then um, they pick a threshold and generate this, uh, what's called in a giant in matrix. Uh, it's a way of representing in computer science, right? Uh, a network, you can look at the uh, edges. This is a binary representation, it's only on and off in this example here, the mat matrix at the bottom, a giant matrix. It only shows if there is an edge or not, but uh, the, the correlation values uh, there uh, could be used as weights uh, if you really want to have a weighted graph that represent uh, the gene network. The gene co-expression letter. <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, w, you know, everybody probably heard of WGCNA, uh, which they use weighted edges indeed. It's not a, a simple matrix. And they also use a dynamic threshold uh, in order to consider if the edges, I mean, it's not just, yeah, they still have to, to decide when there's a, the, um, the edge is present or not. So they still, and some thresholds to decide that. And their thresholds are apparently dynamic and they consider various thresholds and essentially the one that leads to what's called a scale-free topology of the network, uh, those are uh, considered um, in the final outcome of the network. Now, again, this is just, I have uh, no exactly, I don't know exactly how WGCNA works. The deeper they are more, Com complex issues there, but uh, this is like an overview, right? A primer. Now, of course, uh, the reminder about the correlation versus causation, because there's still a, a big ep epistemic uh, opacity issue there. When you have correlation and you, you are so very, very often tempted to infer causation, right? And uh, there are just funny examples that about how, how easy it is to tempt well, in this case, they don't make any sense to connect the two, but it's just uh, you know anecdotal ways to have very high correlation coefficient and then no obvious connection right between the two. Um, now, there's when it comes to another thing that you know this was thinking when I started after uh, Leo presented that suspicious art of. Uh, what was that of single cell? <laughs> uh, that paper uh, last time, I was saying this could be like a suspicious art of uh, gene uh, networks, uh, gene co-expression networks, because sometimes, you know, the output is essentially a huge matrix. And some, when you try to even have some sort of intuitive representation of, uh, of these uh, co-expression networks, uh, you end up with these monsters of, uh, visual, uh, which I don't, I don't think they are very useful and they are, could be fun to, to play with. I mean, especially if they're made interactive so you can pull on the nodes and stuff, but this is like a, a fluff visualization stuff that doesn't seem to be very useful to me. I mean, it's hard to make sense of those edges in the, on the right there. So plotting this is not it easy. So even estimating them visually, unless it's a very simple uh, network with just a few nodes, um, it becomes, you know, completely, uh, I guess, useless. I don't know. That's how it looks to me. But <laughs> if you try to read too much into into it, now, now um, how they prepare the input uh, data here for the for this all these thirty six experiments. So there are three essential. Uh, well, yeah, I guess three 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 essential calculations that transformation, let's say normalization is the first, and they, they consider various types of normalization, but also no normalization at all. We'll see that in, in the, uh, the other transformation was recommended uh, when you do a correlation analysis and WGCNA has a very nice page about how to, uh, web page to, to show how, what transformation are, are good for doing correlations. And it's, this is, uh, 
The one they recommend is a very unstabilizing transformation, which usually, I mean, I think it's very often used the, the log transform, like we have a log, log of the expression value plus a pseudo count, which is assumed to be one in most cases. I mean, it's just an easy way to, to, to avoid the, the zero there. Um, which can be done even directly on, on counts understood, even though it doesn't make much sense, it's better to do it on the normalized or some normalized values, right? Um, and they, after you do the correlations, they, they is, uh, when, you, uh, when you build uh, the networks, uh, there is uh, this post-correlation transformation, which is called in this paper, network transformations, just to make it clear that it's about, you already have the network, you only have the correlation values, but there is some filtering based on the topology of the network that, is, that can be applied by uh, up weighting or down weighting the connections, the edges uh, between the nodes there in the network. And it seems to, as you see in the, in the paper, this, uh, it doesn't seem to have a big impact on the, I mean, it's something that could be tried at least in the way they build these networks. And that's another, problem with this paper that they didn't use WGCNA at all to estimate the, the network, uh, the, the, the accuracy of the networks and stuff. They, they, they build the network with using a, uh, a, like a relatively naive way, just using person, person correlation and then a, a C++ library uh, to, that to just build a graph of the networks in a very straightforward way. Now, of course, the, the motivation for the paper, they mentioned it a few times, it's that they, 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 this, this kind of analysis uh, were, were done in the past for, for micro, or a micro arrays, but uh, not for an ACIC data. So they claim to that this is like a, a, the most comprehensive analysis to date about how to use, uh, start with rna -seq expression data to get the, uh, the gene, uh, gene co-expression networks. <clears throat> now, again, these are claims, and again, we are very skeptical about a lot of them, so I had to uh, try to look at the details. And uh, so uh, let's see the, yeah, it's based on the recount to data, which is interesting. That's good. We have a lot of data there. Um, you can see the 9,000 uh, GTEx and 6,000 SRA, a total of 287 data sets. Um, now, again, the three stages of, you have uh, within sample normalization, and it was a good review for, for me to get all this normalized. They actually described very quickly uh, the normalization uh, methods, and they could, uh, that was also very useful uh, to look it up. Uh, you know, the CPM, TPM, RPKM for the within sample normalization. I guess there are other possibilities. That's what they, they tried here. Um, and between sample, you have this quantile uh, TMM is, I think it's, yeah, it's from edge R. Uh, and I think yeah, it's trimmed mean of M values, uh, then upper quantile, and then some variations where uh, TMM, TMM is uh, of TMM and the upper quartile. Um, which are called in this paper CTF, counts adjusted with TMM factors, and CF counts adjusted with upper quartile factors. factors. Okay. So um, network transformations, then it's the one you mentioned before. After the correlation values are, are computed, they, they somewhat modify slightly the, uh, the weights using these methods that apparently known in the, in the field, uh, weighted topological overlap and CLR. Um, context likelihood of relatedness. Again, this seems like a, a so, sort of a, not, it's not a heuristic per se, but uh, as seen in, in their results, especially the weighted topological overlap doesn't seem to, to improve according to their uh, ground proof and standard, according to their evaluation, especially uh, WTO weighted topological overlap doesn't seem to help with the uh, accuracy of the networks uh, reconstructed. Now they use this, they say all combinations, but of course it's only some of them make sense. Uh, for example, um, I think it was TMM, I mean, 
uh, CPM, TPM, and RPKM cannot be really followed by TMM because TMM uses uh, as input the, the actual counts, the original counts. So it doesn't make sense to use that up on the RPKM values, for example. So some of the combinations are not valid, but they really try the, all those that are valid between these uh, methods, including none. That's another thing that actually it's, uh, it's a problem. So they didn't apply any normalization and they only use that uh, log transformation, just various, some variant, variance st stabilizing transformation. Um, they still get good results. We'll see that that's another problem uh, that I think it's, it's still controversial in, in the results of this paper. So, <clears throat> yeah, they, they described the procedure. Of course, they filtered quite a, a bit the, the data. So they make sure they have some, some, at least five samples in each data set, which is kind of a low number, but uh, and they filtered the gene, uh, to ended up with 22,000, around 20,000 genes in, across the two data sets. Um, yeah, the way they actually use the get, because I know the count too is interesting. I don't know, I didn't have the actual counts apparently per gene, right? So they actually, they re, they got the, from the weak files, I guess, or something base coverage, you say, they use to recover, to convert the base coverage, to convert into read counts per gene. They actually even went as far as trying another method of uh, alignment because, you know, recount two data is processed in very uniformly and that's very good, but they wanted to see what if we uh, apply the same uh, tests on other data, uh, other type of processing, alignment, read alignment. And so they use this refined bio database, which I had no idea exists, but they have also some uh, SRA data sets processed there, aligned and uniformly, but using slightly different methods and uh, read counting methods that's uh, different from read counting. And they claim that they reproduce the pretty much the same uh, um, outputs using this different uh, approach. Of this refund bias focus on transcripts. Oh yeah, and actually, yeah, they say that they summed up the, <laughs> which are the, summed up the reads for read counts. Uh, to get the, the transcript counts, right? And to get the gene counts, right? Yeah. I mean, this was all gene level, but um, yeah, that's all. Now, what, the, what was their over, the overview of their pipeline? Uh, yeah, as you, uh, let's see what we should study. Yeah, the data is mentioned there. Uh, the, the filtering, the initial filtering, the important thing, the steps are the the colored ones, right? They have the within sample normalization methods, CPM, RPKM, TPM, and none, which is just yeah, skipping that. Uh, and uh, between sample normalization, the, the second row, uh, row there after the. And all of this, even though they used also none, no processing at all, they, uh, all of these uh, combinations still went through. Uh, their version of variance stabilizing transformation, which they choose instead of using the, the regular log, uh, they use um, hyperbolic arc sign or inverse hyperbolic sign transformation, um, which it's essentially just a, a variation of the log transform, but the pseudo count there is not, is not a constant. And apparently that's very, uh, that, that prevents some uh, effect of the log, the usual log transformation uh, amplifies uh, low counts too much, apparently. So this is a way to prevent that uh, when for low counts using um, this hyperbolic arc sign transformation instead of the log transformation. Now they use, uh, 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 again, just Pearson correlation, uh, which was one of the uh, objections actually of the, of the reviewers. So that's another thing uh, I want to mention. I mean, I don't know how often you went through uh, look when you read papers. I found it's very interesting nowadays with the open review process to look at the correspondence between the reviewers and uh, and um, 
Yeah, and the authors. And that was very, uh, for me, some of the discussions that they had there, I mean, it was, a th uh, it was like three rounds of review for this paper. So it was interesting to see how, you know, the initial uh, draft was uh, this, uh, they were asking for quite a few clarifications and there were actually good points, even though they made it in the final paper, the discussions actually helped me clarify some of the notions to um, some of the questions that I had even about the nomenclature that they used in the final version of the paper. So another thing is here is that you know, one of the discussions was around uh, using only the Pearson correlation when there are other methods out there right now, uh, especially when it comes to machine learning uh, approaches that they, they found other ways, non-linear non and uh, to, to do these correlations. And, but they use this, all this project was based on uh, running this uh, co correlation in a very fast way. And I think that's why they focus on this slip mirror, I think it's pronounced, I don't know how it's marked, uh, C++ library to compute this uh, very fast, these correlations and to uh, create this uh, networks based on the correlation. Instead of running WGCN, which I suppose it might be faster and uh, slower. Right? And that's why they chose this uh, slip near the C++. And this only did uh, use person correlation for that. Right? Um, now, that is the main claim here that they mentioned, though, that they tried Spearman too, I mean, uh, but uh, found that person led, uh, person led to more accurate. Now, again, this that I, put, I put in the red here things that are, uh, I think they are uh, debatable, right? Because it's all based on what, how they build the ground truth, right? And in order to understand what they did there, we have to, I was thinking to, I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with the gene ontology project. I mean, I guess it's, yeah, it's common knowledge. It's just a refresher about, they actually um, have this, this is a control vocabulary approach of classification of, of, of uh, various uh, biochemical interactions or processes, right? They have these three, big domains of, uh, of knowledge of molecular function, biological process and cellular component. And this paper focus on the, uh, like these are like three, uh, three trees, right? Uh, uh, this paper focus on, on the biological process domain, which is of course relevant for, a, a, for functional relationship between genes, right? That, I mean, molecular function is also could be there, but that's a very low level of molecular biochemical level. For biological functions, we look at the biological process uh, subtree, let's say. This is actually, this is not a tree, sorry, just to make it clear. I mean, it's usually the browsers that you see out there for the for the Go, uh, for gene ontology. They are shown as trees, but uh, they are actually directed as, as, as cyclic graphs. Uh, so basically in that tree representation, some of the leaves or some of the nodes actually in the tree branches even uh, they can be shared between uh, between let's say branches or sub trees right so they are not the, uh, yeah they, they are not unique in the tree representation <clears throat> so you see again the right you see there on the, on the right here yeah, that would be a more accurate even though these are all directed uh, directed edges so there is always a direction to this, and you know it's acyclic, so you cannot have uh, cycles and uh, cycles by by the direction of the edges, right? This is a um, known concept in, in computer science, right? It's a, a DAG, right? It's a, one of the very useful ways of uh, representing uh, directionality in uh, in processes and uh, workflows. Um, now it's important to, to see because for this analysis to understand how how they build their ground truth or gold standard for these evaluations um they use this evidence code so when you on go notation is a go term one of these uh, terms from this hierarchy is assigned to a gene product basically this is transcript level which is important even though uh you know, most of the, uh, some of the assumptions is that gene expression includes all the transcripts, right? And that could be a problem because 
that Go ontology itself is, is built on, on each gene product that I myself, because some transcripts for a gene might have different functions sometimes. It's uh, not very often, but it, it can happen, right? So isoforms from a gene. So anyway, important thing is uh, they, they look at the Go uh, annotation by, by also by considering the evidence code that, that is attached. So when you assign a, a Go term, a Go annotation to a, to a gene product, uh, you have to provide an evidence code. How, what's the evidence that you use to assign this annotation? And I don't know if uh, any of you worked in annotation before when, a while ago. I'm not sure how rigorous this process is. So, uh, so I have some, I mean, I'm very skeptical about, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I'm very skeptical about the way these evidence codes are, 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 are really supported and sometimes by, by actual evidence. I mean, there is a rush here to assign go annotation to your hypothetical proteins that you might find or something. And you might, I'm not sure if it's just, uh, I'm not sure how well this is, uh, this is a control, this assignments and uh, yeah, I, mean, I guess this is sometimes it's assumed a lot of people do analysis of these co annotations, which is, you know, which is, seems to be like a second level of, of uh, trying to infer uh, conceptual analysis, which could be, could get uh, really uh, problematic if the actual annotation itself is not very reliable. Um. So the problem is here, how do they build a ground truth, right? So the main assumption that they use here is that basically uh, we can assume that go on, uh, go go on attention. If two genes uh, or two, well, I guess we'll see, we say genes because they didn't even go to transcript level, but this, these two genes uh, or proteins uh, have a co annotation. It means they have assigned same Go term. Um, then it can be assumed that they have a functional relationship, which is again, uh, I guess it, I mean, it may say, I mean, in terms of vocabulary, yeah, they, they seem to, to have the uh, same, they, they are in the same biological process because this is using just Go, uh, Gene Ontology, the biological process branch. So, and some of these assignments are, uh, I don't know if you What if the cell has redundant systems for the same biological process? You right. can have two different mechanisms, right? Right, that's... And like, that's, you're from mechanism yeah. A, you're not maybe related to any expression or mechanism B, right? Mm. If you, I guess they're assuming that like within a gene ontology annotation, it's the same, like, um, uh, go back to cause, right? It's the same, maybe, mechanism of causing. Uh, <laughs> what, like, what, you, when you visualize things on CAC, it's the. Uh, oh, okay, right. Uh, pathways. Yeah, the same pathway. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, looking, this is an example here, right? I, I just clicked on the open. The, you know, you have this negative regulation of GTP is these are the kind of processes that you see there. And if the idea is that if two genes, two proteins were assigned to, to, to the same annotation, they, they are part of this process, right? So, I mean, it sounds reasonable, right? Especially, also you have to consider uh, this, the way this tree, let's say we still visualize in our head as a tree because it has depth, it's easier to think about it as a tree. Uh, the lower you go, I mean, towards the leaves, right? The, the more specific the terms are, right? So it doesn't make sense to assign, for example, a co-annotation, right? To assign biological regulation there. It's a huge, you see how many, the number next to the branch, to the, and there is how many, um, proteins or gene products were assigned to that particular process. And that's a very wide, it's very non-specific, right? Biological regulation is nothing. Uh, I mean, it's a lot. Uh, so you cannot de decide exactly as you asked, right? If it's genetic, it's a too generic pathway or too big. It's not even a pathway there. Biological regulation is like more like a concept, right? It's not 
that's another problem with how do you how specific are these concepts? And supposedly, when you go deep enough in the tree, uh, or let's say the farther from the root, uh, then it it gets more specific. So you can say, oh, this is actually a pathway, right? Most likely, it's a pathway, but I'm not sure how clear it is, how far you have to go, distance from the from the uh, root, from the, yeah, it's, uh, they have a lot of metrics. So gene ontology has been around for a while, so they have quite a few uh, metrics they define uh, how, how specificity and how, how well you can. So this is, a, of course, important for all this analysis. So now, of course, the way they, the reviewers actually, uh, asked quite a few times about, uh, can you justify if, you know, co-expression, uh, how, how, why do you keep making this connection between co-expression and functional relationship based on go co-annotation, right? And uh, if you see the, the, if you actually try to quote a bit of from this uh, paper, they, the justification of the author seemed very redundant in many places. And keep, keep, keep re and it's based on a bit of, you know, uh, like, oh, prior studies link this co-expression to go annotation. And they provide references indeed, but again, all those prior studies, they also made the same assumption. And they even say that it was tested, this hypothesis. And that's, again, hard to argue if the testing of the hypothesis was done with, with, uh, with this kind of methodology uh, that's still based on you know, go annotation and the discussion in, in it was pervasive across the, the whole round, the three round of reviews for this paper. They still had some doubts that the model is, uh, the assumption here that that Go co-annotation is enough to 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 to, to, uh, to decide that you know that they are actually part of the same. Uh, they have a functional relationship, right? Exactly the question that the first first asked. So yeah, there was a lot of uh, going around and circular reasoning, uh, apparently, and, and, and I don't know, that's how it feels reading the justification that they were trying to answer to reviewers. It was interesting to, to read, but yeah, there is some literature. I mean, this is, again, part of what I thought left to be the suspicious um, art of uh, Jin. You have to start with uh, these assumptions, otherwise, yeah, there's no way to pick on the, uh, you know, to try to guess function and you say start with the correlations that's way to see patterns and just try to yeah so yeah that's was kind of a, now the way they do uh, the true positive edge selection in detail is they have would you be more comfortable with them saying like like these are methods to try to use quick expression to reconstruct the, the gene ontology um, <laughs> the other way around no like we're gonna evaluate um Jinko expression uh, methods in their ability to, to reconstruct the, sorry, Jinko expression, yeah. I believe Jinko expression networks in their ability to, to reconstruct the gene ontology biological process classifications, right? Yeah, I think. Like that would be like, at that point, like, I mean, that's what they're doing, right? You're not. Yeah, that's what they're doing. So if you right? look at the. Like, like instead of saying gold standard, like they say like, okay, Yes, good the question. That's uh, but I think the next slide. Sorry, yeah, just sorry. I don't think people can like for uh, you want to read out loud the question. Yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> I'll get back to it. Oh, basically, it's about the uh, neg true negative edges. Yes, uh, that's uh, that's actually all. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So, yeah, that's uh, actually what they did here, but that's another part of the process, it's a little bit arbitrary. So uh, they used to, they try to pick a specific enough set of uh, Go terms right here, which is indeed, uh, that's, that's a, a bit of a black, bo black box uh, thing. With, let's decide this, this, this 607, they found uh, highly specific uh, Go terms. And only when uh, the true, true positive edges were only considered in the in the gold standard, so called graph, uh, when these edges were they were between these 
these two terms co-annotated um, genes or gene products co-annotated uh, to any of these 607 chosen, uh, expert chosen <laughs> terms. Uh, um, so this is, yeah, they said that like have, they have some sort of expert panel, which was uh, made of, I think uh, they even, you know, to the reviewers they discussed that, I think, you know, I don't think it was in the paper. Seven grad students and, uh, and postdocs with the experience in uh, bio, uh, in molecular biology and stuff like that. It was interesting how they justified the, the expert panel that uh, handpicked these 607 highly specific go terms. And also they considered, they were, they say, only those assignments, go term assignments that have this experimental evidence called a specific set. And they try to avoid circularity here by eliminate, by excluding a specific uh, evidence code in go, which is, IEP there, which is inferred from expression patterns, uh, which is exactly what, I mean, run an ASIC expression in this case, right? It makes sense, but now the problem is how reliable those other codes are, because for example, EXP inferred from experiment, I'm not sure exactly how, who's, uh, how well regulated this um, control, this, uh, all these submissions of, of Go assignments are, is there a committee reviewing all this? Because I guess it is. I mean, gene ontology's consortium does that, uh, try to tries to do that. And, but they are interested also in, in making their tree as rich as possible, right? So there's always a rush there for, you know, let's classify this and yet, and they infer from experiment. I don't know what EXP called there because this was considered, because experiment could be also considered, uh, I, I mean, should hopefully some sort of a uh, lab, uh, wet lab experiment, I'm not sure because, so we count on the reliability of whoever submits these annotations to gene consortium, right? To, that they are reliable enough. I mean, that's another can of worms, I suppose. But like the annotation that you see in GenBank sometimes, yeah, I don't know how reliable sometimes is there, right? Anyway, so this was a way of assigning two positive well, it was based on selection of specific goal terms, right? So they say, oh, this is a true positive. So they essentially, they had these sub subsets of the goal, uh, right? The goal tree, the goal notation, and they only use only those to build their so goal standard, which as you can see, is very restricted to this number of goal terms. And so it depends on availability of the annotations and stuff. So I guess they consider a trade off there. Um, now it's interesting now that this seems to be a method they resurrected from a paper 15 years ago, which actually they could, it was very similar. I think they, I don't know what's the connection. I mean, I noticed what the connection is that the authors of this paper in 2006, which used the same principles of selecting based on Go BP terms, selecting some sort of ground truth for the, for a yeast, uh, it was a, a genomic a gene expression, co-expression network, uh, found in, ex explored in, in East. Um, so, uh, and <laughs> the connection interesting is I mean, maybe like a gossip, but it's not, I think it's important to see how the authors of this 2006 paper actually are the main authors there. I think are also the, not I think, I'm sure they are also the ones who wrote the sleep near C++ library that this paper is uses. Uh, so I suppose there was some, some sort of uh, genealogy there of the of the <laughs> how they chose this method. I mean, it's not necessarily original. That's what I'm saying. It was resurrected from 15 years ago. But I guess yeah, it's a way to build a ground rule. Now the negative edge. I think that was the question that she's not asked there. Um, they had a way of dealing with that. Of course, you cannot consider everything to be a negative edge, right? If it doesn't fit uh, the other criteria. So they had to be some to, to, to select this, to have these rules. They had a 75, a set, another set of 75 handpicked less specific goal BP terms uh, that were considering, you know, if uh, both genes are not connotated, then uh, a true negative edge would be assigned. And also they have actually all these three conditions here should be met in order to assign a, a a negative edge. Negative in the sense, not of the negative correlation, right? It's just a non-interaction. That's what 
it means here negative is lack of uh, no edge, right? <clears throat> So yeah, I mean, the, the, they seem, it seems to make sense, uh, these rules, I mean, to just exclude, to make sure that you can assign, but again, it's the same reliability of, of go uh, BP terms, the go BP means uh, go biological process, right? That, that's a branch that I'm looking for, that's the domain. Um, and these, uh, I mean, I, look, I noticed that they use this analysis, interesting analysis uh, for the, I mean, there is, uh, as I said, uh, in Go, in gene ontology has a lot of uh, metrics defined already. And especially when you do Go enrichment and stuff like that, there, there are a lot of methods that they use uh, as established methods to, to select even, to look at the semantic or functional similarity between uh, terms in the Go annotation. This is hypergeometric test, which I think it's also used for, uh, for gene enrichment. And, uh, similar analysis. So, but again, this is based on the Go uh, the gene ontology uh, terms, not on anything uh, you know related to the uh, proteins themselves. I mean, it is just playing with the concepts in the in Go annotation, which seems to me uh, again a little bit abstract, right? The, the, but it's a way to to yeah to have some to assess similarity between. Go a distance, some sort of function, uh, semantic distance, I suppose, between Go uh, terms. Um, yeah, that's another problem that I noticed with uh, this paper was uh, they didn't actually publish the, they didn't release the, the Go, uh, the gene, the gold standard that they, uh, they put there. I mean, they said that I looked at the website they, after some pressure from the reviewer. Uh, viewers, they, they put there some uh, source code and uh, <coughs> also some, I think the, the tissue, what's called, they call tissue aware, uh, which is supposed to be tissue specific initially, but I now realize that specific doesn't make sense. So there are tissue called tissue aware so, uh, gold standards because they, they also try to do that by, by tissue. Uh, separate these so-called ground truth networks. And there was a discussion there between the viewers and, uh, and authors that I thought it was interesting about how their work is not really, it was really for these benchmarking purposes. So it's kind of limited, I suppose, that was the point. And they didn't really want to advertise like some sort of generic ground truth like CAG or other, um, apparently there are many other uh, uh, resources out there that actually they publish their networks uh, while this paper really didn't want to make a big deal about the ground truth except for the you know process and saying that it's limited in scope for this benchmarking uh, yeah purposes so I don't know again how to it's still when you see that there is no clear transparency. I didn't even see the set of 607 gold terms. At least that list should have been should be interesting to have, right? To see how, how they pick that. And it's not, doesn't seem to be available there. Maybe I, 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 mean, I look into the, the GitHub repository where they post the code and I see some tissue aware uh, that, that, that files, which I suppose could be readable in some way, but not the ground truth that was used for like, they build, they build a generic one first and then subset it for each tissue um, just to do some, some sort of tissue aware uh, analysis. And that initial set is not there from what I noticed. But yeah, they say that you can reproduce our analysis. I'm curious, how can you reproduce it if you don't have that uh, initial set of 607? But again, maybe I missed it. It seems it wasn't very clear from discussion because the reviewers had to push in the second round for the publication of <laughs> Of the of the code at least, but not of the network. The network was not explicitly published from what I noticed. The ground truth. Okay. The what issue aware that I mentioned? So they try to subset the, the generic uh, network that they built for ground truth. Uh, they subset for it with some genes, some specificity for each tissue. Uh, they use the list of tissues from this uh, website. Interesting to look at the, what the genes are specifically expressed. So they intersected that, of course, with their gene annotation, um, go annotation for that they chose. And 
they had some, I, I, I don't think this adds, apparently one of the reviewers also suggested that this doesn't seem to add much uh, uh, to, to the original analysis of just non-specific tissue, non tissue, tissue naive, they call uh, analysis, because you know it's the same problem. These are actually a subset of the original network that they built ground root from the tissue naive network, so it's called. So uh, it doesn't add much to value to, but even though they, they, I mean, they have these nice graphs for tissue and stuff like that, which was good for, for making some nice figures. Okay, I guess it's too much and it's getting late, but. <laughs> so <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> sorry, I think uh, we could uh, maybe stop soon and we could continue the presentation next week. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Because, I mean, you're, you're providing us a lot of background information, which is great. Yeah, um, so I think uh, instead of rushing to, yeah. uh, on the results, I think it might make more sense to, um, um, to continue next week. So uh, yeah, you're using this paper also at times to highlight like problems in, in, in the bioinformatics field in general, <laughs> yeah, that's right? Okay. Which is like, how do you create a gold standard? Um, like, are your results reproducible? Um, like what are, what is expectation and reproducibility for people, right? If, if it's just like, here's a code, you can run it. Um, but is it like actually, something you can really run or is there maybe a piece ingredient that you're missing? And so then it goes back to like the data availability is like upon request, right? From the authors, right? Um, so there's a lot of interesting discussions you're, you're bringing up.